It was a, it was Passover season. The annual feast that was the Independence Day of the nation of Israel was drawing near. It was the year of celebration of their deliverance from Egyptian bondage. And the highway from Galilee to Jerusalem was clogged with pilgrims on their way to the Holy Feast. Leaving Jericho, Jesus and his disciples were among the crowd that was ascending the east side of the Mount of Olives on their way to Jerusalem. For many of the crowd, the Passover was expected to be no different than any other Passover. Just the usual enjoyment and fellowship of the great feast. For those who had been following Jesus closely, there was perhaps an afterglow of excitement from their events that had happened in Jericho. The salvation of Zacchaeus, the tax collector, and the healing of the blind man Bartimaeus. Be it even they had no certain clear expectation of what was to come. As was the custom among the Jews, as they traveled to Jerusalem for the feast, they sang various psalms. At Passover time, the most common psalms were those called the Psalms of Ascent, which are Psalms 120 through 134. And also the Hallel Psalms, which are Psalms 113 through 118. These particular Psalms were Psalms of praise, encouragement, remembrance, and hope. They also spoke of the events of the Exodus. As the crowd neared the town of Bethphage, which is very near the summit of the Mount of Olives, something unusual happened. Jesus had secretly sent two disciples ahead to fetch a donkey and her colt. And now the crowd saw Jesus stop and climb onto this young donkey. As a side note, I might say that the other gospel writers do not mention the mother donkey as Matthew does. They just say that the colt that Jesus rode had never been ridden before. But that's the very reason why Matthew mentions that, the mother. For a young donkey, a colt, that has never been ridden before, is apt to resist that unfamiliar weight of a person climbing on, onto his back for the first time. So the mother donkey is present to help stabilize and calm the colt so that it will accept that weight. Matthew shows that Jesus understood the needs of a donkey colt. And so he included the mother in his preparation and planning for what was about to follow. As Jesus climbed on the donkey, and started forward over the summit to begin its ascent toward the Kedron Valley, several hundred feet below. The multitude, many of whom already acclaimed Jesus as a prophet, and who knew their Bible, quickly recognized that Jesus was doing something special. He was acting out the Messianic prophecy of Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 which says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the full of a donkey. With that recognition, the crowd quickly cut down palm branches and began waving them. And some of them spread their outer cloaks onto the road in front of him giving him what we might call the, the red carpet treat, that which is reserved for special celebrities or royalty. And they began singing from Psalm 118, 
which is the last of the Hallel Psalms. It is a psalm that is especially associated with the Passover feast. And in fact, it is part of the normal ritual of that feast to sing this song on the evening of the Passover. In verses 25 and 26, Psalm 118 says, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And this celebration of the multitude continued down the mountainside, across the Kedron Valley, up the east side of Mount Moriah, and in through the gates of Jerusalem, a distance of more than two miles. And as Del shared, it really stirred up the people in Jerusalem as to what was going on. The word Hosanna means deliver us now. As God through Moses had delivered the ans their ancestors from Egypt in answer to their prayers, these people were calling for Jesus as their Messiah to deliver them from Rome. The title Son of David was a very common title for the Messiah because God had promised that a descendant of David would always sit on the throne of Israel. Now this whole event is really kind of surprising in light of the rest of, of the Gospel story. For up to this time, throughout Jesus' ministry, he had actually discouraged people from any expression of belief that he was the Messiah. For example, at the feeding of the 5,000, as recorded in John 6, verse 15, the people there, seeing the miracle, wanted to take Jesus by force and make him king. But he refused to allow them. Jesus had even silenced demons who had cried out that he was the Son of God as they were being cast out of a person. And even with the twelve, Jesus often told them not to share with others what he was sharing with them in their private talks. However, now, Jesus welcomed their praise and their proclamation that he was the Messiah. And when some Pharisees among the crowd complained, Jesus told them that if the people were silent, the very stones along the way would resound with similar praise. So after years of silence, of Jesus' ministry. Jesus was deliberately revealing himself to the people of Israel as God's anointed Messiah. He intentionally planned for that donkey to be available for him to, to fulfill that Christ's prophecy. And now he was openly receiving their worship. But Jesus did not stop there. We read in Matthew 21, verses 12 and 13, Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer. But you have made it a den of thieves. Now, the Gospel of Mark tells us that the cleansing of the temple occurred the next day after his entrance into Jerusalem, saying that Jesus had arrived in Jerusalem late in the day. That is very likely what really happened. But Matthew wants to be sure that we recognize that there is a direct connection between his ride into Jerusalem on the donkey's cult and his cleansing of the temple. So he moves directly from the one to the other without any transition. The cleansing of the temple was also an intentional act, an act of kingly authority. 
throughout the nation's history, spiritual reform succeeded only with the leadership and encouragement of the king. So Jesus was acting as king when he demanded an end to the buying and selling in the temple complex. His displeasure was not in the commercial activity itself, for it was a necessary business to meet the needs of Jews coming to Jerusalem for the feast, especially those coming from a long distance and from other nations. However, Jesus was saying that it didn't belong in the temple. Not even in the court of the Gentiles, which to the Jew was not as sacred as the rest of the temple. Jesus was saying that their action, that to, to do this business in the temple was a violation of the sacred purpose for which God had had that temple established and built. When Jesus said, my house shall be a place of prayer for all people, he was quoting Isaiah 56, 7, which is a passage that, that talks about God reaching out to those who, who a Jew would consider an outcast. And the reference to a den of thieves comes from Jeremiah 7, 11, where Jeremiah was pronouncing God's judgment upon the, the Jewish leaders, for they had, had corrupted the temple in their day, which was just before and led to the Babylonian exile. So Jesus was claiming that the temple was no longer being used in a manner acceptable to God. Not because the buying and selling was wrong or corrupt, but because by having it in the temple, they were stealing from the Gentiles that place that God had designed and given to them to seek Him and to pray. But Jesus did not stop there. Another part of a king's responsibility is to care for his people, especially the poor and the needy. To protect them from evil and to instruct them in the ways of God. And so, reading from verses 14 through 16 of chapter 21, Matthew tells us, then the blind and lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things he did, and the children of crying out in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant and said to Jesus, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you ever read out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have perfected praise. Mm -hmm. Jesus was again displaying his kingship by his healing those in need, by teaching the people, and by confronting the scribes, Pharisees, and chief priests. Those enemies of God in the coming days constantly questioned and challenged Jesus' authority. And Jesus responded by teaching parables, such as the parable of the two sons, the parable of the landowner, and the parable of the marriage feast. These parables expose their hypocrisy in rebellion against God. And Jesus used them to pronounce God's judgment against the religious leaders. And for that reason, they determined to get rid of him, thinking that they could get rid of him by crucifying him. But everything that happened from this journey into Jerusalem and the cleansing of the temple to the end of that week, the crucifixion and the resurrection. <clears throat> was all an intentional proclamation that Jesus was God's anointed Messiah, the King of the Jews. 
And it was also a proclamation that the whole sacrificial system was no longer valid and was about to be replaced. For the new covenant that had been promised in Jeremiah 31 was about to be established. And so, during this week we had one dramatic proclamation after another. An eight-day drama of God working out His eternal plan, even through the hands and actions of His enemies. At the beginning of the week, on the journey from the Mount of Olives to Jerusalem, the crowds were praising Jesus. At the end of the week, they were silent, confused, fearful, angry, and disappointed. Because the end of the week did not match their expectations of the Messiah. What about us today? Do we praise God only when things go according to our expectations? Do we become disappointed and silent when they don't? Is our praise consistent with our claims of faith? For us on this side of the resurrection, we should exceed the exalted praises of those Passover pilgrims of long ago. For we have experienced the result of that moment week. Jesus has saved us from our enemies and our sins. What enemies? The enemies of guilt and fear and disappointment and hopelessness and loneliness. Jesus might not always feel, fulfill all our expectations, but he does satisfy our hungry hearts and fills us with his strength, his love, and his peace. So let us always go forth, boldly seen and speaking out joyful praises to our God. Not just every Sunday morning, but beyond Sunday morning. Let us praise Him daily, recognizing that no matter what our circumstances, Jesus is Lord over them. And He will see us through every experience if we put our trust in Him and praise Him always. For God is good all the time. All the time. God is good. God is good. Amen. Amen. Let us now stand and join